Hello, hello and a warm welcome to all of you, dear mayors, dear friends from UNESCO cities, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to today's celebration of the World Cities Day 2020. I am Valerian Gauthier, journalist and TV presenter for Friends 24, and I will be moderating today's event. First of all, allow me to thank you again for being with us today for this annual event dedicated to cities around the world world and their contribution to sustainable urban development. Uh, this year we will pay a tribute to communities and their essential uh, role in making cities better so as to create a better lives for all urban inhabitants. Without further ado, uh, please let me introduce you to Ching Chu, direct, uh, Deputy uh, Director General of UNESCO. So thank you. Thank you for being with us. I'll leave you the floor. Okay, thank you. Distinguished ambassadors, honorable mayors, dear representatives from UNESCO cities networks and programs, dear friends. It is my great pleasure to welcome you all today to this online virtual celebration of the World Cities Day 2020. In 2014, the United Nations General Assembly designated 31st October as World Cities Day to promote a better understanding of urbanization and its impact on societies. The day also underscores the importance of building new connections and partnerships between city actors who are on the front lines of the implementation of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. It is often said that the battle to achieve the sustainable development goals will be won or lost in cities. To win this battle, cities will have, will have to continue to drive innovation, ensuring that no one is left behind. 
COVID-19 has visibly reshaped urban life around the world. Local communities have once again demonstrated their importance in building resilient and sustainable cities and played an essential role in responding to the pandemic, paving the way for recovery and beyond. Ladies and gentlemen, in line with the United Nations 2030 Agenda, UNESCO has focused on a comprehensive and cross-cutting approach to sustainable urban development that keeps communities at its heart. This approach echoes the 2020 global theme of Road Cities Day, valuing our communities and cities. UNESCO's extensive experience, as well as its city networks and programs, provide a wealth of knowledge, data, and the best practices related to the ongoing transformation of urban spaces and lifestyles, as well as diverse responses to the ongoing pandemic. Across all areas of its work, UNESCO advocates for people-centered and the place-based urban development approach, emphasizing the need to re-humanize cities by reconnecting them with the people who live there. Bringing this knowledge together in one place is the goal of the UNESCO Cities Platform, which brings together the organization's eight city networks and programs from across its various fields of expertise, covering, uh, covering more than 1,500 cities across the globe. The platform fully illustrates UNESCO's comprehensive and cross-cutting approach to city and sustainable urban development. Dear friends, on the occasion of the World Cities Day, UNESCO aims to further emphasize the importance of community participation and reflect upon how to create better lives for all urban inhabitants. Communities are at the heart of sustainable urban development. Therefore, UNESCO calls upon member states, cities, urban stakeholders, public and private institutions, amongst others, to engage with communities systematically and strategically in urban planning, implementation, and management to co-create the cities of future. The achievement of SDG 11, which aims to make cities and the human settlements inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable, will only be possible through strong leadership, the engagement of local authorities, and above all, the widespread participation of communities. Communities are the binding force for all our collective endeavors. I thank you for your attention and I wish all of you a very fruitful, fruitful discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um... Sorry, I was having some issues uh, with uh, starting my video. Thank you very much, Jing Chu, De Deputy Director General of UNESCO. Thank you very much for your words. And I would now like to give the floor to Ernesto Otone, Assistant Director General for Culture at UNESCO. Hi, how are you all? Mesdames et Messieurs, vous m'entendez bien? J'espère, chers collègues, c'est un réel plaisir d'être présent well, aujourd'hui à vos côtés pour célébrer la journée mondiale des villes qui mettra cette année à l'honneur le rôle central des communautés dans la construction de villes durables et résilientes. La plateforme des villes de l'UNESCO, que notre DDG vient de vous annoncer, et qui coordonne l'organisation de cette célébration, se compose de huit programmes et réseaux de l'UNESCO dédiés aux villes et issus de tous les domaines d'expertise de l'organisation. 
de l'éducation, la culture, en passant par les sciences, la communication et l'information. Récemment lancé par l'UNESCO afin de renforcer son approche globale du contexte urbain, la plateforme regroupe aujourd'hui près de 1500 villes membres. Son objectif principal est de créer des nouvelles synergies et d'élaborer de nouvelles pistes de coopération entre divers programmes et thématiques dans l'optique de favoriser le développement durable au niveau des villes. Dans cette perspective et depuis sa création, la plateforme a multiplié les événements et les activités afin d'accompagner au mieux les gouvernements locaux et l'ensemble des parties prenantes des villes à réaliser l'agenda 2030 pour le développement durable et notamment l'objectif 11 consacré aux villes et communautés durables. Il y a exactement un an, à l'occasion de l'édition 2019 de la Journée mondiale des villes, la plateforme s'était déjà mobilisée en organisant quatre tables rondes réunissant des représentants de plus de 20 municipalités de toutes les régions du monde afin d'engager une discussion sur les enjeux majeurs du développement urbain, dont la durabilité et l'action pour le climat, la régénération urbaine et l'inclusion sociale, ainsi que l'innovation technologique. La la plateforme des villes a également pu être présente et présentée lors d'autres événements majeurs tels que le sommet Change Now 2020 en janvier dernier ou encore lors de la dixième session du Forum urbain mondial organisé en février dans la ville d'Abu Dhabi aux Émirats arabes unis. Conscient de l'impact multidimensionnel de la pandémie de la COVID-19 sur les villes, la plateforme a organisé dès juin 2020 une réunion en ligne intitulée « Solutions urbaines » s'inspirer de l'action des villes face à la COVID-19. Et ce fut, euh, tout en offrant une plateforme d'échange et de discussion, cette réunion a suscité une réflexion collective et approfondie sur les villes résilientes, durables et vertes de demain. Plus récemment, la plateforme a initié un projet pilote conjoint de recherche sur la ville de Mexico, qui occupe une place toute particulière au sein de cette structure, car elle est la seule membre et coopère étroitement avec ses six réseaux et programmes. À travers une approche transversale, je suis convaincu que ce projet donnera sans doute une illustration concrète des missions de la plateforme. Cette journée sera également l'occasion de découvrir découvrir chacun des réseaux et programmes qui composent cette plateforme, ainsi que leur réalisation et leur publication phare. Il ne me reste plus qu'à vous remercier pour l'attention et bien sûr attendre avec impatience vos contributions à cette importante journée. Merci beaucoup. General presentation of the UNESCO Cities platform and its recent activities, which provided us with an overview of what UNESCO does for and with cities all around the world across all its fields of expertise. Now we will introduce you to uh, the eight UNESCO programs and networks on this interdisciplinary platform. I will remind everyone of these eight uh, programs. First, we have uh, the UNESCO Creative Cities Network. Then we also have the International Coalition of Inclusive and Sustainable Cities, UNESCO a Global Network of Learning Cities, the World Heritage Cities Program, uh, then we also have a Mega Cities Alliance for Water and Climate, the Disaster Disaster Risk Education and Resilience, uh, Media in, and Information Literacy Cities, and finally UNESCO and NetExplore Observatory. Uh, we will now have a four minutes presentation of each of these programs to explain what they do and what they stand for. To start, I would like to uh, call to the floor Denise Bax, who's a chief communi of communication cities and events unit at the cu culture sector. Denise Bax, the floor is yours. Thank you, Valerian, for giving me the floor. Ladies and gentlemen, UNESCO Creative Cities Network, or UCCN, is currently composed of 246 cities from over 80 countries that aims to promote cooperation with and amongst cities that have identified culture and creativity as strategic factors for sustainable urban development. 
the UCCN has recently undertaken a series of activities. Today, I am pleased to launch the Spanish version of publication titled UNESCO Creative Cities Response to COVID-19, already available in English, French, and Chinese. The publication features a wide range of culture-driven urban responses to COVID-19 from over 90 creative cities around the globe. The UCCN also organized, together with the city of Beijing, the third edition of the UNESCO Creative Cities Beijing Summit in September. The summit gathered the mayors of Beijing, Rome, Helsinki, Brazzaville, Kortrijk, Santos, amongst others, to discuss the role science and technology, along with creativity, can play in building resilient and sustainable cities of tomorrow. Over 100 cities worldwide followed the meeting, while more than half a million views registered across different platforms. I would also like to mention our collaboration with UNESCO Regional Office for Culture in Latin America and the Caribbean and UN Habitat to collect good thesis from the region on cultural heritage and creativity in the transformation of cities. Finally, allow me to share with you all a video to showcase UNESCO and its creative cities solidarity and support to the city of Beirut. Thank you. Thank you very much, Denise Bax. I think we are waiting for the video. It should start very soon. Beirut, ville monde, ville mémoire, ville créative. Beirut, I... city of the world, memory was hit at heart in its identity. For Beirut, other creative cities of UNESCO have responded to a call to solidarity. I would like to thank UNESCO for taking a leading role in Beirut's recovery and to thank UNESCO's network of creative cities for its unwavering support through international solidarity and cooperation. Together with all of you, we will revive the cultural vibrancy and creativity of our capital city, Beirut. UNESCO Creative Cities should give examples to all cities worldwide that solidarity is creativity. Thank you for helping Beirut. UNESCO calls on each of us and all cities to support Beirut. Together with the people of Beirut, we can work to rebuild and restore the city's rich cultural heritage and cultural life. Thank you very much again, uh, Denise Bax. Thank you for everything. And uh, I would now like to give the floor to Angela Mello, Director for Policies and Programs for the International Coalition of Inclusive and Sustainable Cities. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, or good evening, good morning from Paris. Uh, excellences, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the World Cities 
day 2020. My name is Angela Mello, as you said, and the director of the policies and programs at the human and social science sector. I am proud to present to you today some major initiatives that has been conducted by the, so, the sector of social human science through the network of the International Coalition of Inclusive and Sustainable Cities, ICAR. So we established the webinar series entitled Inclusion in Time of COVID-19, Addressing Racism, Discrimination and Exclusion, which aimed to highlight the research policy nexus in addressing the crisis and highlight the most effective local policy interventions. From April to September of the year, a total of 15 webinars were organized and welcomed more than 70 speakers, more than half of whom, whom were women, including IR cities, as well as associated cities and partners, and 3,000 participants, such as member states, local authorities, academics, NGOs. This will result, result in a policy brief that will be published by UNESCO to promote and support inclusive policymaking approaches at the national and local levels. Given the lack of COVID-19 related to data in Africa, UNESCO partnered with the Association of Canadian Studies in collaboration with the nine African cities and in ICAR, which you'll see on your screen, yes, to conduct the project entitled COVID-19 Social and Economic Impacts in Sub-Saharan Africa. The project aims at identifying key issues, indicators, and uh, social demographics to generate evidence-based responses that address the social and economic dimensions of COVID-19 crisis in Sub-Saharan Africa including discriminations and inequalities. The outcomes will serve as evidence-based for policy recommendations from UNESCO member states, ICAR cities, and other stakeholders. We held also regional experts consultation series against racism and discriminations that we conducted from 18 September to 21 October with the aim to deconstruct racism and discriminations and unpack the societal challenges of COVID-19, resulted in the set of concrete recommendations that will guide our future work, including at the city level in combating racism and discrimination. It also addressed the issue of intersectorality with regard to racism and discrimination against women and other vulnerable groups. The consultations welcomed 40 experts and with a total 23 women as eight either speakers or moderators across the different regions and more than 1,000 participants around the world. UNESCO co-hosted with the city of Jungju, Republic of Korea, lead city of Asia Pacific Coalition Cities Against Discrimination, the 10th edition of the World Human Rights Cities Forum in October. Participants adopted a declaration that deplores uh, ra racial discrimination and strongly advocates for an anti-racist culture in the cities. We also held UNESCO's master classes series against racism and discrimination is gaining traction from various partners around the world, including within the International Coalition of Inclusive and Sustainable Cities, ICAR. One year since its launch, more than 1,000 young people, women and men, have been trained in four sessions with the students from various regions, Africa, Arab region, Asian Pacific, and Europe. And the series that aims to change, to, to, to try to contribute to, to change their mindsets and empower them to become new ambassadors against racism 
within their own communities. The next edition will be organized in order to member cities, Heldenberg, Paris, Mexico City, and Guadalajara. Other editions are foreseen in 2021 in Bordeaux, uh, Bridgetown, Brussels, Buenos Aires, Campinas, Geneva, Jeongju, Lausanne, Los Angeles, Montreal, Oslo, Quito, Toulouse, among others. Through these initiatives, UNESCO, together with the member cities of the ICAR, are scaling up our efforts to address the contemporary challenges of a rapid evolving world. In the spirit of today's celebration, may you continue to strive for inclusive, sustainable development through international cooperation and community building. Uh, we would like to show you a short video of our cooperation with the Mexico City's Council for Prevention and Elimination of Discrimination, Corporate. Thank you very much for your, for your kind attention. Hola, ¿qué tal? Es para anunciarles que la Ciudad de México, como parte de la Coalición Internacional de Ciudades Inclusivas y Sostenibles, ICAR por sus siglas en inglés, y otras redes de ciudades de la UNESCO, como la Coalición Latinoamericana y Caribeña de Ciudades contra el Racismo, la Discriminación y la Xenofobia, se une con gran agrado a la celebración del Día Mundial de las Ciudades. En este día, desde el Consejo para Prevenir y Eliminar la Discriminación de la Ciudad de México, el COPRED, queremos reconocer el enorme papel que tienen las ciudades en el combate a la discriminación, la xenofobia y el racismo a nivel local. Sabemos que son ellas quienes día a día, a través de distintas acciones, construyen una cultura por la no discriminación, fomentando la inclusión y el respeto a la diversidad cultural. En este sentido, nos complace anunciar que en conjunto con la UNESCO llevaremos a cabo una masterclass sobre racismo dirigida a la Red Ciudadana por la Igualdad y la No Discriminación, la RedSI, que es una red creada por parte del COPRED, conformada por ciudadanos y ciudadanas que tienen como propósito promover los derechos a la igualdad y a la no discriminación en nuestra ciudad. Asimismo, esta masterclass estará dirigida también a personas del programa Pilares, una estrategia muy importante del gobierno de la Ciudad de México dirigido por la doctora Claudia Sheinbaum. Dicha sesión también forma parte de las actividades que realizamos en el marco de la estrategia de octubre por el mes de la cultura por la no discriminación, que celebra justamente que el 18 de este mes es el día por la no discriminación en la Ciudad de México y tiene por objetivo reconocer la riqueza cultural y la diversidad humana para promover el acceso igualitario a ple pleno a todos los derechos y sobre todo celebrar la diversidad, ciudades diversas y ciudades incluyentes, ciudades de derechos. Thank you very much, Angela Mello. Thank you very much for this uh, presentation of the key activities for the International Coalition of Inclusive and Sustainable Cities uh, program. And we will now hear from uh, Raúl Valdez Cotera, team leader at UNESCO Institute for Lifelong Learning, regarding the UNESCO Global Network of Learning Cities program. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, distinguished ambassadors, uh, dear mayors and representatives of the city networks, ladies and gentlemen. Greetings on behalf of the UNESCO Institute for Lifelong Learning in Hamburg, Germany. I'm quite delighted to welcome all of you to this important event on the occasion of the World Cities Day. The UNESCO Global Network of Learning Cities was launched in 2013 with the aim of providing inspiration, know-how, and best practices on how lifelong learning should be uh, a reality at the local level. Since then, uh, next slide, please. Um, UNESCO has been uh, leading cities that effectively mobilizes its resources in every sector to promote inclusive learning from basic to higher education, to revitalize learning in families and communities, to facilitate learning for and in the workplace, to extend the use of modern learning technologies, 
to enhance quality in learning and to foster in general a culture of lifelong learning throughout life. In doing so, the city enhances individual empowerment, social cohesion, economic development and cultural prosperity and sustainable development. There are good examples of cities among the network that by reinforcing the people's center and learning focused approach, link education with other sectors such as culture, health, work, environmental issues, engaging also a wide range of partners such as the private sector, civil society organization, academia, etc. Uh, in the last months, the learning city members had worked hand in hand to share their solutions, not only providing learning during the pandemic, but also overcoming the crisis itself. More than 25 webinars have been organized with cities together with experts to exchange ideas on contingent, contingency plans and measures taken. Uh, today, the GNLC composed more than 200 cities from 64 countries and continues to position itself strongly at the crossroads of all SDGs by promoting policy, dialogue, peer learning among cities, forging links, fostering partnership, providing capacity development and developing instruments and learning materials. As part of these materials, the GNLC has developed eight animated video tutorials with different topics, planning, monitoring, education for sustainable development, etc. Today, we are using the opportunity to launch a video tutorial on gender equality in cities. That has been developed in cooperation with the UNESCO section of education for inclusion and gender equality. So many thanks uh, to all of you uh, for, for being here and let us enjoy the video on gender equality in cities. A successful learning city can support and promote gender equality and achieve its sustainable development goals through gender responsive education policies, plans and activities. To advance gender equality in learning and education, you need to know where things stand, recognize the challenge in your particular context and ensure your city has a good understanding of gender concepts. Once you understand the issues, you will want to address them in your Learning City Action Plan with a timeline and shared responsibilities to ensure gender responsiveness in learning. And foster a commitment to continually advancing gender equality in lifelong learning through good policy decisions and a dedicated budget. But what does it take to understand and implement gender equality as an integrated part of your Learning City Action Plan? We've broken it down into seven key areas. One, develop a joint understanding of gender equality in education and learning. Two, identify the challenges. Three, engage relevant stakeholders. Four, build capacity and encourage inclusive programming. Five, strengthen education and learning policies. Six, conduct regular research. Seven, raise awareness. Now, let's dive into each area to learn more. Thank you very much. Thank you, Raul Valdez Cotera pro, from the UNESCO Global Network of Learning Cities program. And I would now like to call to the floor Jyoti Osagraha, Deputy Director uh, for the World Heritage Center to talk about the World Heritage Cities program. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, the World Heritage Cities program, um, I think that the, uh, yeah, the world, uh, the, I was waiting for the slides to come up. 
the World Heritage Cities program, um, we could progress to the next slide, uh, is linked to the 1972 UNESCO Convention concerning the protection of the world cultural and natural heritage. It is one of the six thematic programs that's formally approved and monitored by the World Heritage Committee. We have uh, today more than 315 cities in the thematic uh, program across all regions. Um, so the program mainly addresses World Heritage properties on the basis of uh, being, you know, the urban areas that are large, significant, representative parts of cities, could be a city center, port, a quarter, as well as those that are included almost, that include almost the entire city or town um, as the, the area that is inscribed. Uh, in the World Heritage List, the World Heritage properties that are living functioning settlements uh, in the contemporary context where the heritage structures are intertwined uh, in with the life of the city, the cities that have uh, cultural landscapes within them. So there are different ways in which uh, we can identify these World Heritage cities. Uh, the main objective of the program, of course, is to support the World Heritage cities in better managing their urban heritage and support them to address the challenges of protecting the heritage while undertaking sustainable urban development. Uh, so the activities that we undertake primarily are one, the development of theoretical frameworks, guidance, tools, and, uh, and tools for urban heritage conservation. The second is the provision of technical assistance uh, to states parties for the implementation of new approaches and schemes. A third is communication um, with the cities generally, with all um, those interested in the urban issues in general and uh, networking of site managers to support them uh, as well as mayors, uh, to support them to enable sharing of experiences, challenges and solutions, and also co-learning co and capacity building. And finally, sharing good practices for integrating um, cultural heritage management with sustainable urban development in the cities. Next, please. The cities program supports the management of world heritage cities through diverse capacity building activities for experts, mayors and site managers to disseminate and assist uh, the integration of heritage protection at the core of sustainable urban development strategies for historical uh, for, for historic cities. Now, this is also directly linked to the 2011 UNESCO recommendation on the historic urban landscape, which recognizes the importance of the interconnections of built heritage with its larger context and the natural landscape, uh, the local communities, their use of and meaning of, for, uh, of space and their intangible cultural heritage and creativity. I want to, uh, uh, next please. Um, I want to also mention here that um, the World Heritage Cities program has been active in different forms uh, to support urban areas in leveraging culture-based solutions and strategies to build cities that are stronger, more sustainable, uh, more resilient, more deeply connected to their histories and landscape. Towards this, one of our major initiatives this year was the organization of a World Heritage City Lab in June uh, this year, when um, that aimed at developing strategies for urban heritage and sustainable development with a specific focus on uh, recovery and resilience, uh, at the role of urban heritage for recovery and resilience, in the context of COVID of the COVID-19 pandemic and uh, the accompanying shutdown. So we had a major, we have first had a, a uh, first part of the city lab, uh, which was over two weeks actually, but uh, over several sessions. Uh, the first one included seven mayors uh, from World Heritage Cities, uh, the Assistant Director General for Culture, of course, and, uh, and several uh, high level participants. And then there were uh, more than 60 uh, different experts who were engaged uh, through uh, the different uh, sessions uh, over two weeks. And it was also a way to engage a younger generation of emerging professionals uh, in this area. 
Um, so there were also additional activities uh, during this period in between uh, the main sessions. So it was a very intensive two week uh, effort. On the first day, uh, uh, this high level uh, webinar uh, was also focused on recovery and resilience um, and included also the Assistant Secretary General for, uh, for UNAP. Next, please. Other uh, important initiatives uh, that we have been undertaking this year uh, was the launch of the uh, e-newsletter Urban Notebooks uh, and the World Heritage City Dialogues. The World Heritage Cities program has strengthened its collaboration with site managers and has developed channels to disseminate different efforts made on site uh, for the sustainable management of urban properties, uh, urban heritage properties, especially in the context of the current pandemic. Um, and these channels have included uh, the online monthly e-newsletter Urban Notebooks that um, uh, also curates uh, various practices from the different cities, uh, information news from the cities, as well as activities and uh, that are undertaken at UNESCO and elsewhere that are relevant to them. So it's activities, news, uh, views from experts and so on. It includes, includes also a section uh, that focuses on cities for their local actions and site managers uh, so that the videos and so on that are also part of it. Um, and uh, the dialogues, the World Heritage City Dialogues is a way for periodically gathering site managers and focal points of World Heritage Cities, World Heritage Sites, um, specifically the cities, uh, for each region separately. So we have several dialogues across uh, for each of the regions so that the, the site managers in each specific region are able to interact and, and exchange about uh, the, the challenges and issues around management of urban properties. Next, please. In terms of management, uh, the project uh, addresses the complexity of intertwining layers and supports the development of uh, adapted actions, models and tools by the cities in its network. This means going beyond traditional regulatory and economic tools and putting the emphasis on participation and uh, knowledge sharing and planning initiatives. So um, looking around uh, the world, we can see and we can look at many different examples of uh, community participation and engagement in Georgetown, reactivation of traditional crafts in Fez, uh, reuse of buildings, integration of architectural infrastructure developments and housing, as in the case of Mozambique, um, management groups and stakeholder coordination uh, in uh, Edinburgh. Um, next, please. And I want to, this is the last slide, I just want to leave you with a number of complementary initiatives and reference materials uh, from that you can find uh, on the web pages of the World Heritage Cities program that you see here. Uh, but also the publications, uh, the Culture of the Future publication, that was uh, the first global survey of uh, urban uh, uh, heritage uh, and sustainable urban development. Um, the New Urban Agenda, which is very closely linked with the, uh, the 2011 uh, Historic Urban Landscape Recommendation. Uh, and the thematic indicators for culture in the 2030 agenda, which is across all the six culture conventions and three recommendations of UNESCO, but is a way also to look at and measure the role uh, of and contribution of um, culture at the urban level uh, uh, towards uh, the 2030 agenda. With that, I'm going to leave you uh, with these resources. Thank you very much. There will be a film a little bit later on uh, one of one of the World Heritage Cities, uh, but that's not, the video is not linked to my presentation, but you will see it a little bit later in the program today. Thank you very much. Thank you to you as well, Jyoti Osagraha, for this uh, presentation of the World Heritage Cities program. I would just like to remind everyone to please stick to your four minutes because uh, we are uh, we are running a bit late. Uh, so let's now talk about the Mega Cities Alliance for Water and Climate program with Alexandros uh, Makarigakis, a program specialist from the science sector. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone uh, listening to us today. 
I'm going to present for you a, an initiative that uh, we have started in UNESCO, uh, which started actually in 2015 during uh, the COP21 that was held in Paris. And it's called Mega Cities Alliance for Water and Climate. Uh, next slide, please. During COP21, uh, we organized a, a big conference, the first international conference on that uh, same topic, and a declaration was signed for the creation of this alliance. The idea is that we will create an alliance that will give the space, it's going to be an international collaboration platform, where world's mega cities will be able to work together at different levels uh, in order to find solutions in uh, managing their uh, water resources and services uh, while they're uh, taking into consideration the effects of climate change. Why is that? Is because uh, the world is getting urbanized and we will have 43 of uh, these mega cities in 2050. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, where are we now with this uh, initiative? We have a, a number of regional platforms that we are establishing uh, and we have meetings uh, to do so. Uh, the first one uh, is going to take place now in the uh, end of November for the Latin American and Caribbean chapter of MAWAC. Uh, the one for Europe and North America is being planned for January 2021 and the Asian Pacific one in February 2022. Uh, we are also in discussion with uh, mega cities from Africa and the uh, Arab states in order to organize a regional meeting for them there too. Uh, in December 2020, we were supposed to have the second international conference on water mega cities and global change, but due to the sanitary restrictions that uh, the pandemic has posed upon all of us, uh, we would we had to postpone this. Uh, big conference to December 2021, most likely for the second week. Uh, in the meantime, in order not to lose the momentum, uh, we will have a pre-conference, which will take place during this uh, 7 and 11, from 7 to 11, uh, 2020, from 1 to 3 Paris time in order to facilitate uh, the different time zones. We'll have a, a youth participation, and in uh, between that time and the time of the uh, second international conference, we will have a new call for papers in order to uh, capture issues of COVID-19 and uh, water services in mega cities. And we will organize a number of webinar series, just like the one we organized uh, in uh, July on the effects of COVID-19 in water services in mega cities. Next slide, please. So. At the same time, we are organizing uh, for the launching of, of uh, the, the platform in 2021, in December 2021, the platform itself, uh, which will have uh, different uh, pillars to help networking between the mega cities, data depositories, and also a QGIS platform. And we're putting together the strategic global framework for the Alliance, which practically will bring together four key stakeholders, decision makers, utilities and operators uh, that deal with water and wastewater, academics and river basin authorities, right? With the vision to uh, secure water in mega cities where communities will be prosperous, resilient to the effects of climate change and will be able to develop sustainably while preserving the environment. Next slide, please. Okay, last but not least, a number of products will come out of this. We were able to uh, present at uh, Habitat 3, 16 megacities monographies uh, based on the results of the first international water conference. We're moving ahead now with the second edition of these uh, monographies that will be launched in 2021 during the second international uh, conference. And uh, we will also uh, select 10 papers out of the 434 papers that we have received for the conference to uh, co-publish along with uh, the electronic uh, open access journal water uh, in again right after the conference. This sums up a little bit uh, uh, our efforts to date. Uh, we hope to see more of the interested parties uh, to our uh, web uh, pre-conference virtual um, 
setting in December and uh, most of you in person in Paris in December 2021. Thank you. Thank you, Alexandros Makarigakis. Thank you for being with us. And I would now like to give the floor to Soishiro Yasukawa, Program Specialist from the Science Sector, who will talk about the Disaster Risk Reduction and Resilience Program. So Ishiro Yasukawa, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I think your microphone is off. Could you please switch on your microphone? There we go. Yes, thank you. Uh, good Let's afternoon. Start again. Sorry, yeah. we, sorry, we didn't sorry, hear the sorry, beginning of your sorry, presentation. Sorry, sorry, I lost 20 seconds. Okay, good afternoon, good morning, and thank good evening, ladies and excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Soichiro Yasukawa, Program Specialist for the Disaster Risk Reduction DRR. The risk of natural disasters is rising. Climate change, urban pressure, and lack of disaster preparedness are increasingly transforming natural hazards more disastrous, causing loss of life and economy. The number of people in urban areas exposed to a cyclone is estimated to increase to twofold to 680 million people, and those at risk of earthquake increase from 370 to 870 million by 2050. Uh, next, slide, next slide, please. Uh, while the Sendai framework for DRR is the international roadmap, other global agenda, including sustainable development goals, Paris Agreement, and the new urban agenda have targets which cannot be attained without DRR. There is clear links between those international instruments, as you see on the left side. Uh, UNESCO operates at the interface between natural and social sciences, education, culture, and communication, playing a vital role in constructing a global culture of resilient communities. Our contribution is focused on the eight thematics shown on the right side, such as early warning system, science, technology, and innovations, school safety, disaster risk reduction for culture, risk governance, and social resilience. All of them support to reduce the risk in the urban area, and especially risk governance is related to community-centered urban development. Please take a, take a look at the video of UNESCO's intervention DRR. The link will be shown in this YouTube stream. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we have a DRR project in urban context around the globe, and I highlight two projects. One is uh, effective risk communication with citizens in the urban area, and the other is local community involvement for DRR. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a project in East Africa to enhance risk communication with citizens on the real-time information on disaster using artificial intelligence, AI. It is crucial for both citizens and governments to have and access to the necessary information before, during, and after natural, disaster, natural hazards. However, the needs of citizens are so varied and it is difficult to find the exact information they need. So UNESCO, collaborating with ICT companies, will develop an artificial intelligence chatbot with which citizens can receive more localized warning and to find the necessary information of public support for recovery of their lives. The AI chatbot will be developed in five countries in East Africa, Kenya, Rwanda, South Sudan, Tanzania, and Uganda. Uh, next slide, please. And this is the last one. Uh, this is a project of integrating multi-stakeholders engagement for the Build Back Better after the two big earthquakes that hit Mexico City and Oaxaca State in 2017. Uh, in order to help ameliorate the response and reconstruct process for the future hazards, UNESCO UNESCO worked with different ministries and local communities to collect the stories of how decision makers reacted in the front line and extracted lessons from their stories. 
we summarize the key message in the text and the video style. These stories will be shared among the DLR staff in the government, local government, NGO, citizens to be prepared for the natural hazard in the future. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Soichiro Yasukawa. Thank you very much. And last but not least, let's now hear from Davide Storti about the two last programs, uh, Media and Information Literacy Cities, as well as UNESCO NetExplo Observatory. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, and good morning, afternoon, evening to everyone, excellently, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this week marked the celebrations of the 2020 Global Media and Information Literacy Week, which uh, addressed these information and divides by uh, enhancing everyone's uh, competencies. As you know, Media Information Literacy, or MIL, includes the competencies to search, critically evaluate, use and contribute information in media content wisely, the knowledge of uh, rights online, and uh, information on digital literacy and other literacies. The UNESCO's communication information sector uh, continues to promote UNESCO MIL uh, Cities Framework, an initiative born on the occasion of the Global MIL Week in 2018. Um, and the MIL Cities initiative uh, place its focus on citizens. Its main objective is to uh, set cities on a path to innovatively empower more citizens with MIL competencies while uh, connecting with other cities across the world. UNESCO uh, and partners have launched two publications at MIL Cities, which offer recommendations on how MIL Cities could be designed, monitored, and uh, dovetailed with the existing smart cities frameworks and practices. The two publications, which are available on, uh, on, the, on the page, that uh, the link should be available in the, in the, in the, in the, in the screen, marketing, uh, communication, and technology and innovation in MIL Cities, the second one is from smart cities to MIL cities, um, talking about the metrics, which is inspired by the vision of UNESCO in this regard. Um, a third resource is, uh, is going to be published by the UNESCO uh, Unit Win Cooperation Program in Media and Information Literacy and Intercultural Dialogue, the MILID University Network, and is uh, entitled MIL Cities for Media and Information Literacy, Informed, Engaged, and Empowered. So UNESCO and the International uh, uh, University Network of Media Information Literacy, International Dialogue, Intercultural Dialogue, uh, um, also contributed to the response on COVID-19, including a series of webinar organized by UNESCO uh, last uh, summer until September, uh, called uh, the Milit Gown and Town Initiative. Uh, this uh, included a series of webinar on topic about uh, uh, male cities for everybody, information-driven social dialogue. Um, and uh, also for, uh, I would like to mention that for the World Cities Day 2020, uh, in a few moments, actually, uh, actually it's uh, probably now, uh, at the 3 p.m. CAT, a webinar will start on MIL Clicks Facebook page uh, with the city officials from Brazil, Mexico, Jamaica, and the Republic of Paraguay. Uh, the webinar is uh, focusing on how cities will uh, uh, should be reorganized around information and digital technologies enhanced by the MIL frameworks. During the session, some participating cities will possibly, possibly announce that they will join the piloting of UNESCO MIL cities framework. And I would like to quickly remind how cities can engage and become MIL city. Uh, but they can do it by, by fostering the integration of MIL aspects into city policies initiate the MIL city vision, encouraging and assisting the promotion of MIL related content in city public facilities, uh, and also support and partner with MIL stakeholders, including libraries, schools, universities, and other municipalities or local government authorities to set up and monitor uh, MIL networks uh, uh, locally or nationally and build synergies with the UNESCO led MIL Alliance. Uh, and finally, I'd like to mention <coughs> the um, UNESCO NetExplo uh, Smart Cities Forum, which took place uh, on 22nd and 23rd September 2020 in a, in a new online format, of course. And the event, which was attended by 6,000 internet users from 45 countries, discussed trends in digital innovation, 
that are shaping digital society is in a sustainable way. And for the, on the occasion, 10 cities around the world were awarded by NetExplorer in recognition of their innovation efforts in different domains. And through, uh, during this event, uh, through analysis and content and uh, examples, uh, the event supported the conceptual transition from smart cities to linking cities, uh, which uh, goes beyond the technological aspect, focusing on cities, uh, developing connected, intelligible, intelligent and sustainable in, uh, inclusive ecosystems. And, um, and uh, uh, the, the meaning is that cities uh, uh, should uh, cultivate close and constant connections between citizens, territories and other cities. These are, uh, concepts are explained in a publication Smarts about cities forging links for the future, co-published by UNESCO Net Explore for this uh, forum. The uh, next, uh, the, the first of uh, linking cities UNESCO Net Explore forum uh, is expected to happen uh, uh, in 2021 on 14 and 15 April 2021 at UNESCO headquarters. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, David Estorti. Thank you all very much for these very useful uh, presentations. We will now uh, focus on a specific research project, a joint pilot research project on Mexico City. Let's start with a presentation of the project from Denise Bax, who coordinates uh, the UNESCO Cities platform. Thank you, Valerian, for once again giving me the floor. Ladies and gentlemen, the UNESCO Cities platform covers more than 1,500 cities from across the globe. Mexico City has a unique position thanks to its membership to six of the platform's networks and programs. The position in which the city is placed provides a fertile ground for the platform to further understand as well as showcase the multi-dimensional nature of sustainable urban development. This is why UNESCO recently initiated this joint pilot research project on Mexico City. The project aims to raise further awareness of the importance of the local dimension in achieving the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development amongst UNESCO's member states and other stakeholders. It also intends to highlight the organization's strong engagement in and continued work on cities and sustainable development. An analysis is forced to be developed to demonstrate how a city's engagement through several urban dimensions via various UNESCO cities network and programs has allowed it to have a holistic development approach. This research project may also pave the way for a voluntary local review by the city, demonstrating on the international level its engagement and action in proactively pursuing its path towards sustainable development. The analysis of the project will also allow UNESCO to reinforce our collective actions on the field. Finally, the research study on Mexico City will be a stepping stone towards undertaking similar research projects in other cities to draw generic lessons and discuss how the platform can bolster sustainable urban development through a transversal and comprehensive approach. I thank you all for your kind attention. Thank you to you as well, Denise Bax. Thank you very much. It is now my pleasure to invite to the floor Rosara Ruiz Gutierrez, Secretary of Education, Science, Technology and Innovation for Mexico City. Thank you very much, Valeria. Uh, it's an honor to participate in this meeting on behalf of Dr. Claudia Schenbaum, Mayor of Mexico City, a city of human rights and innovation. As Minister of Education, Science, Technology and Innovation in one of the largest cities of the world, I am convinced that a sustainable future for humanity 
relies on our capacity to have effective communication of urban, of urban communities with policymakers. This will be possible through cooperation and knowledge, applying city diplomacy and understanding supported by scientific and humanistic capacities. Mexico City participates in six UNESCO city networks, namely the Creative Cities Network, World Heritage City Program, the International Coalition of Inclusive and Sustainable Cities, the Megacities Alliance for Water and Climate, and the Disaster Risk Reduction and Resilience, among others. This engagement shows the diversity of challenges that we face derived from excessive urban growth and also from global threats such as climate change. To make a change of paradigm towards more inclusive and sustainable cities, we need to comply with policies and international agreements based on scientific and humanistic knowledge and incorporate society into this process. Being aware of this crucial step, we have created a chair on size diplomacy and heritage under the umbrella of the ECOS, a program of uh, universities and research centers of Mexico City and UNESCO Mexico. The chair of science diplomacy and heritage is devoted to study and promote science diplomacy in Latin America as a mechanism for strategic alliances, advances, advancing the sustainable development goals and the promotion of scientific heritage as part of the cultural diversity of cities. Science and humanities are universal languages that can strengthen diplomacy and international cooperation for development. We would like to invite all interests to participate with us in this initiative. Paraphrasing the Mexican scholar and diplomat, Alfonso Reyes, the only way to be profitable national is to be generously and passionately universal. The UNESCO Cities Platform is an outstanding example of this spirit of knowledge and cooperation. I would like to end my intervention reaffirming the commitment of Mexico City with this platform. For us, it represents the opportunity to advance an integrative city agenda and to put forward the value of science, humanities, technology, and innovation as keystones of the political culture and governance of cities. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Valerian. Thank you very much to you as well, Rosara, Riz Gutierrez. Thank you very much for being with us on this special day. We now have some key video messages we would like to show you. Uh, our first video message is from Justin uh, Simons Obi, Deputy Mayor for Culture and Creative Industries of London and Chair of the World Cities uh, Culture Forum. Hi, my name is Justine Simons and I'm the Deputy Mayor for Culture and the Creative Industries for London and also the Chair of the World Cities Culture Forum. Thank you for inviting me to share a message for the UNESCO Cities Platform. I'd like to take a moment to recognise what an incredibly difficult year it has been for us all, personally, professionally and for the creatives and communities we support. We're facing unprecedented challenges. Culture and the creative industries have been devastated by this pandemic across the globe with festivals cancelled, theatres and venues closed, thousands of jobs have been lost, and the only thing we know for sure is that the world will never be the same again. But what do we know? We know that creativity cannot be stopped. We know that cities will always be centres of energy and innovation. And we know that coming together for shared experiences is fundamental to who we are as human beings. And what have we learned? We've learned how much culture matters to our citizens. With our theatres and concert halls closed, we've seen choirs on balconies, painting and poetry in our living rooms. But there's no doubt the road ahead will be challenging. The World Cities Culture Forum is a network of 40 global cities, and we all believe in the power of culture to transform lives and places. From Seoul to Sao Paulo, Buenos Aires to Amsterdam, Helsinki to Nanjing, Milan to Sydney, and many, many more. We all need culture because it's the DNA of our cities. Culture gives our cities a distinctive identity, a powerful story to tell. It brings people together, creating bridges when often there are none. 
And if any city wants to be successful in the 21st century, they just can't do it without culture. Let me give you an example. In London, we have the London Borough Culture Award. Last year, Wartham Forest won the award, hosting hundreds of events and recruiting over a thousand volunteers. When the COVID pandemic hit, these volunteers quickly became the frontline helpers to the community, showing the civic power of culture. City leadership is now more important than ever because, simply put, culture is at risk. Together, we're fighting to protect culture and to support the recovery of our communities and our cities. So thank you very much, and I wish you all a very good celebration of the World Cities Day. Our second video message is now from Wu Jin Cheng, Chairman of the Shanghai Municipal uh, Government and of Economic and Information Commission, who is representing the Vice Mayor of Shanghai. 尊敬的曲星副总干事, 尊敬的厄内斯托拉米雷斯助理总干事, 各位来宾,大家好。我很荣幸代表上海市吴清副市长, 对联合国教科文组织世界城市日清点活动的召开表示热烈的祝贺 2010年上海加入联合国教科文组织创意城市网络成为设计之都 同年5月到10月份 上海成功举办了以城市让生活更美好为主题的世博会 重要成果之一，2014年联合国大会将每年10月31日定为世界城市日。近十年来，上海持续推进创意设计服务城市、赋能产业、点亮生活、开展国内外合作交流、践行创意城市网络的使命和目标，以创意设计。打造城市地标，通过与海内外建筑设计公司的通力合作，以及闭幕系统等全过程应用，打造了上海中心大厦、国家会展中心、松江广富林遗址公园等一批地标性建筑。以创意设计点亮生活空间，比如上海黄浦
共同践行，城市让生活更美好，发展理念，使城市更宜居，环境更优美，人民更幸福。谢谢。And that was it for our key video messages. It is now a time to start our urban dialogue while discussing the paradigm of inclusive urban growth. Our debate will focus on how to make cities better to create better lives for the inhabitants. I would like to invite all our speakers to switch on uh, your cameras and microphones. It is uh, my pleasure to welcome to this debate uh, Professor Carlos Moreno, scientific director of the ET uh, chair at the Panthéon uh, Sorbonne University IAE. We also have uh, Seok Jin Moon, mayor of Soedan Moon Gu, uh, Republic of uh, Korea, and also Professor Adrian Parr, PhD and Dean of the College of Architecture, Planning and uh, Public Affairs at the University of Texas. And finally, Adeline Grattard, Chef Etoile. Uh, thank you all for being with us. Uh, just a quick reminder, following each video, one or two speakers will take the floor for about four, mini four minutes uh, maximum. And I, will invite, uh, I would like to thank you all again for uh, being with us. Let's start with a first video on how to build a learning city involving all stakeholders. Every city around the world has its own character and charm, bursting with life, filled with people and organizations with their own unique interests, expertise and ideas. Reflecting this diversity by involving stakeholders from all walks of life is fundamental to promote lifelong learning in your community. The people you need to help build your learning city are all around you. You just need to bring them together. So how do you do that? Develop a coordinated structure involving all stakeholders. A Learning City Development Committee is one example and can be a good foundation to build on. Even though you are promoting education and learning, all groups and sectors should be represented. The council, civil society, local business, schools and colleges, different neighborhoods and community organizations. Individuals and organizations all bring something different to the table. Collectively, their know-how will strengthen and transform your learning city. So uh, I would like to start with uh, this uh, question. What is the role of communities in uh, promoting uh, lifelong learning? Uh, perhaps if it's possible, I would like to invite to the floor uh, Seok Jin Moon, mayor of uh, Saudi Jemun Gu uh, in the Republic of Korea. Thank you. <clears throat> Let me answer uh, this question first. Uh, as introduced, I am the mayor of Saudi Mungu city in Seoul, uh, from my experience as a, a mayor, I learned that community is a key successful lifelong learning. Uh, why? It is because a lifelong learning process should be embedded in one's daily life to create more impact. The efforts to develop the more community based lifelong learning environment from uh, for my city have followed one principle. We made community lead the development process of a lifelong learning service structure. In Sodemungu, there are uh, 15 small community level uh, learning centers, which is designed to serve about 2000 people per center. My city, Sodemungu, has about 300,000 people, and it would have been almost impossible to provide community level service for long, lifelong learners with only one big center. Thanks to smaller scale service of these 15 community learning centers, 
local residents can get um, more involved in planning, operating, and evaluating of the centers. Since the town running center is guaranteed by laws and uh, ordinances, each of these centers are funded by local governments. Its operation, however, is very independent. Uh, serving communities learning these uh, is in a more uh, agile manner. Even smaller study cells are very active in my city. If five residents want to study together a certain subject, they can start a study cell for the subject with support of city government. Now we have more than 200 study cells learning in my city. More specifically, many of these study cells happen in uh, apartment complexes. Since the high rise apartment is uh, the typical type of uh, the housing in my city, my people now meet uh, their neighbors in an elevator, which is called vertical alley. So we tried to figure out the best way to get those who live in the apartment uh, mingled with their neighbors so that they can find common interest of learning. Uh, that is why we started the vertical early project. With this project, city government supports a small community learning in classes in the apartment complex. If a group of five residents at an apartment want to uh, participate in a class of a certain subject, such as art, Korean history, writing, bike repair, dancing, they can ask the city to dispatch an instructor. A class can happen either at a residence room or at a community facility of the apartment complex. This way, people can take a class with their neighbors on their own interest more easily overcoming social isolation. Since its inception in uh, 2013, a total of 50 courses have been developed every year. More than 600 residents each year have registered the uh, four course through the vertical early project. Access to learning opportunities have been significantly widened as at least one sixth of residents in the city live in an apartment. In summary, I can say the local participants can be active decision makers of sediment for uh, lifelong learning policies. They start as a learner of the class. Then they can become an instructor with relevant knowledge and skills. Eventually, they can offer a course as an experienced instructor having a partnership with the city government. I think this kind of open structure of a lifelong learning service is very important to achieve more inclusive participation of people with diverse backgrounds. Thank you for your uh, attention. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Professor Adrian Parr, may I ask you, how can inclusive uh, participation be achieved? Certainly, sorry, just turning the mic on. Um, inclusive participation. Well, in the work that I've been doing, um, I, I conducted four years of site visits in two slums in Nairobi, uh, one in uh, Dagoretti and the other in Kibera. And I wanted to sort of provide a little bit of background on that project as a lead in to answering this question on inclusive development. Um, because if, we recognize that by 2050, we're going to have 3 billion slum dwellers in the world. That's approximately a 2 billion increase based on the numbers from uh, 2017. And we also add into that mix the fact that we have large sort of movements of populations from rural areas into urban areas, such that if at the moment we can recognise that 55% of the world's population lives in cities, by 2050, it's estimated that around about 68% of the world's uh, population is projected to live in cities. And a lot of that urban growth is going to be in low income countries um, and, in, and in the form of uh, slum, slum living conditions. 
So what we're seeing um, nationally is this sort of large scale movement around the urbanization of poverty. And, um, you know, slum dwellers tend to pay five to seven times more for a litre of water than what they typically do, for example, in the United States. They also have a lack of infrastructure um, for, for drainage and sewerage and those sorts of things. Uh, they have, uh, you know, a, a lack of access to, to health uh, and medical services. And um, they're also living in houses that uh, are sort of weak and made out of inadequate materials and are subject to landslides during um, times of heavy rain. So if we, we sort of combine all of these factors together, when I was looking at, um, I did 50 interviews and 40 site visits uh, throughout the two slums. And what I found was that, you know, whilst we're, we're well, it's important to do the macro projects that at, at a sort of planning and policy level to deal with some of these big wicked problems and the ways in which they intersect. Um, for example, the, the slum upgrading program in Kenya, some in interesting work was happening in that regard. However, the ways in which it was translating down on the ground plane were, for example, when you're introducing more infrastructure into an area, if someone's shack is, is now closer to a water point, um, the rent on that shack increased substantially. So what you ended up having was this sort of um, exodus of the, the, the poorest of the poor within the slums, moving further out of the city and then further generating more sprawl, for example, right? And I saw this happening time and time again as I went back to these slums over a four-year period during the slum upgrading project. And the projects that were that seemed to have the most traction and have the most impact were those like the ones that Kunkui Design Initiative is doing, where local actors came forward and identified what their needs were and uh, basically the specialised skills of designers and planners were placed in the service of local actors identifying their most urgent needs. And then the response to what those projects would look like um, and how they would be managed was something that involved participatory planning processes and decision making. And the role of the sort of the macro governmental or entity or the designer or the planner was really more like a facilitator in many senses and someone who could also provide much needed resources and services and information um, when it was required in order to have sensitive well-informed inclusive kinds of uh, planning and uh, design initiatives being implemented in the slums. Thank you, Professor Parr. And uh, let me just remind you all, and we are sorry about this, but uh, we need to uh, have all inter intervention should be about uh, two minutes each, so we all have time to speak. Uh, let's now move on to our second uh, video on a creative uh, city's response to COVID-19.
So with this uh, COVID-19 pandemic, we've seen how much uh, culture and creativity are important for supporting the well-being of uh, its citizens. Uh, using innovation and creativity, how can one strengthen the culture uh, capital in the city? Uh, I would first like to ask uh, Carlos Moreno to take the floor. And let me just remind you, sorry, Carlos Moreno, I think your microphone is turned off. Merci beaucoup. Merci à vous. Et merci pour l'invitation. C'est un plaisir much. de partager uh, aujourd'hui. a few ideas with you. In the framework of this pandemic, uh, we are going through in France since yesterday midnight, we are under lockdown. In order to st st try and slow down the crisis. But don't forget that we are living in the century of climatic change. So we are facing two threats in our cities, uh, which threatens the majority of the inhabitants. First of all, climatic change, which forces us the way we live in order to reduce the CO2 emissions. Uh, by between now and 2050. And on the other hand, we have a, a pandemic which changes the social relations between people. In the University of Sorbonne and in the Institute uh, I'm working and in the city of Paris with the mayor of the city, Mrs. Hidalgo, we have launched a process before the pandemic, which uh, seems to be positive even throughout uh, the pandemic, we have to find back proximity living. We called it the city of a quarter of an hour. So people should be able to find everything within a 15 minutes from their living place. So to reduce risks of propagation, we re should remain in our neighborhoods, we should socialize our activities, we should support creativity, support close by trade, not buying our stuff on platforms, we should recreate our relations with elderly people, with fragile people, with children, and this requires a transformation of the city, which must become a multi center city rather than a single center city, a green city with fewer cars, more women and men, uh, less CO2, people walking on foot or riding bikes with uh, easy access to, to habitat, workplace, uh, shopping, education, culture, and development, personal development. Everything should be within 15 minutes of your house. And the whole city should be like that. The whole city should be several vibrant, creative places. This is what we call the 15 minutes city. And this is what we're working on with the mayor. The 15 minutes city is a very interesting concept and an essential concept in the present pandemic. Adeline Grattar is a chef. The field of gastronomy was directly hit by the pandemic. Many restaurants throughout the world have closed, and today with France, with the pandemic, the, uh, the lockdown, the restaurants are closing again. Why is culture and gastronomy so important to, to the city dwellers? Il semblerait qu'on ait peut-être des problèmes de connexion avec Adeline Grattar. On, il semblerait qu'on have connection problems with Ad Lynn Grattar, we will try to get back to her later. Grattar, uh, maybe Seok Jin Moon, uh, can I ask you as well, uh, what, what would you say? Elle est là. Uh, ah, elle est là. Adeline Grattar, vous nous entendez? 
Can Adeline Gata hear us? The starred chef Adeline Gata, I can hear you. Sorry, it was, uh, the line was cut. Well, no worries. Uh, this is the new online world. Adeline Grata, how does culture, gastronomy being part of culture, reinforces a city? And why is it so important for the good health of these city dwellers? As restaurant owners, we have actions to undertake, first of all, in the field of culture, because each chef tells a story. And our purpose is to please, to please the people that come and eat in our restaurants by telling them a story through food. And the more time evolves, the more chefs write their stories, the story of their travels throughout the world in the dishes they offer their customers. Uh, so we mix cultures the way in the, the way we interpret our food. I personally uh, do Franco-Chinese uh, cooking. I lived in Hong Kong and I present my experience in my dishes. It's a small trip our customers take when they eat in our restaurant. We have a major role to play in the food chain our aim is to feed well the people who come and see us. We have to provide healthy food. And we must be careful about resources. Today, you cannot waste as you used to in the past. And we are the main defenders of non-waste. Restaurant owners must be very careful when they buy their produce. They are here to allow fishermen, breeders, farmers to live better. Question, what are the solutions you offer in an urban context? Answer, we have to choose producers that encourage short circuits because the problem we are facing in Paris is the following. In Paris, you find everything. Uh, we have a major uh, wholesale platform called Rangis. All the products arrive in Rangis from France or abroad, and they are distributed throughout the country, which leads to a lot of transport, a lot of pollution, many intermediaries. Uh, you lose in freshmen freshness of products and costs. So uh, those short circuits have to be taken into account. We should work with the producers, uh, send things by post. Uh, we receive our seashells directly from Brittany, from the producer, which uh, speeds up the process and reduces manhandling and overtension of the system. So produce locally and envisage the possibility of urban vegetable patches. Sustainable lifestyles in the Japanese countryside, Iwami Ginzan Silver Mines. Most important thing to sustain anything. Number one, I learned is the local leaders' leadership. Number two, how the young leaders really participate in reviving anything else. In other words, young leaders is also equally important. Number third, of course, it goes without saying that. Women must provide a basic facilities like roads, electricity, and also now these days water and of course uh, internet. Fourth thing, business communities participation 
in community development. What I learned here was that we don't need to keep building new and new things. It's that being able to maintain the tradition and the lifestyle here is what happiness is. We feel a lot of happiness for maintaining our history and our traditions here. But then we do include it in our daily lives. And I think that that's what everybody feels uh, very accomplished. And that's why they feel fulfilled here. And so that's what we're doing. And that's what we hope to continue doing into the future, into the next generation. And that's what I feel as though it's going to create the new meaning of what happiness is. And this is why Omori is a really good example of that new value, uh, that new meaning of happiness um, for not just simply Japan, but I think also for the whole entire world. So as you saw with this video, uh, within a community participation, youth plays an important role to further support uh, in developing uh, cities. Uh, sustainable urban development also means to have its inhabitants uh, happy. Maybe I'll ask all of you, but I'll ask all of you to maybe stick to a very short answer so the four of you have time to answer this question. How can youth uh, contribute to uh, this happiness and what is urban happiness? according to you. Maybe let's start with uh, I, I, Professor Adrian Parr. Okay, urban happiness for me. So I think it's one where the, the, the sort of the present and, and future urban life is uh, created through processes of what I've called in my own work, urban commoning. Um, one that takes on board three sort of trans processes. One that's transgenerational, involving obviously uh, youth in decision-making processes and planning um, and working through the generations. One that's transboundary so that it's inclusive. Um, one that's also trans-speciesist because as our cities continue to grow, these have land use impacts and habitats are being lost for many, many other species. So we're part of those sorts of problems. And that in this sort of differentiated landscape, people are working together collectively to advance other sorts of universal goals of flourishing, innovation, inclusivity, health and well-being. Thank you. Maybe uh... Maybe Adeline Gattar, do you want to answer? Yes. Um... Okay, can you hear me? Well, uh, how to uh, spark joy? Well, I think it's uh, first and foremost about uh, finding the right uh, balance the right uh, balance uh, at work, at home. How can you uh, find it enjoyable to go to work? In Paris, it's quite tough with public transport being quite unpleasant. So it's maybe about finding a job that is close to your home. I have 25 people working under me at the restaurant and I have people who come from quite a big distance away and I tell them try to come a little bit closer to the restaurant because I think that it uh, really contributes to a stronger energy uh, in life when you don't live too far away from uh, where you work. So it's about uh, finding this uh, right balance. Aline Grattard. Seok Jin Moon, what would you say is your definition of urban happiness and how can youth contribute to this happiness? Sorry, Seok Jin Moon, your microphone is off. If you can switch on your microphone. Okay, sorry, sorry. Thank you. Uh, it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think also the uh, same opinion, uh, the participation is a very important, I think. Uh, so to ensure the participation of our citizens, we encourage that our people uh, to participate uh, the budget. Uh, budget case uh, is a very affected to our citizens' life. Uh, and uh, we uh, have uh, the organized uh, many team of uh, the budget participation team uh, from the communities. And uh, we decided the holistic important and uh, we ranked 
uh, and then uh, it can be a, a decided by the, our council members. Uh, usually, our council members uh, the, uh, accept the, our citizens uh, the suggest. So it's a uh, good way uh, to participate. And another way is uh, that uh, for, uh, to the, the youth people, uh, we are encouraging the youth council and that they can uh, have a good training uh, for the democracy and uh, that they can participate the process of uh, the, uh, our all kinds of uh, the decision making in our the community. Uh, that's uh, the, our uh, one uh, example, I think. And uh, uh, participation is uh, the good elements for the happiness of our the, uh, community, I think. Thank you, Professor Carlos Moreno. Uh, what is your definition of urban happiness? Bien sûr, la, la, la ville heureuse. Well, happy uh, cities uh, are made up of uh, happy uh, citizens. Uh, Adeline Grattar uh, earlier was mentioning how important it is to live close to where you uh, live. It just ties in with the 15-minute city that we mentioned earlier, that I mentioned earlier. And I'd just like to add that uh, in this uh, time of crisis where our health is in the balance, uh, mental and physical health uh, is uh, under attack because of solitude, of anxiety, etc. And a world in which also it's very difficult for us to live alongside other people. Being happy in that context, it's also accepting and embracing diversity and uh, living uh, with each other, even if we don't uh, believe in the same God or if we have a, a different uh, color of the skin. What we need to uh, fight is intolerance. Today, we need to be uh, close to uh, all the services that we need. We need also need to be close to our culture to uh, fulfill ourselves uh, intellectually. And we also need to uh, respect other people uh, and respect them in, uh, in how they are different to uh, what we are. That is very important to uh, have empathy for people around you. We'll know that uh, water is an essential element of our lives, it's uh, vital. Let's now have a look at this video called The Intimate Realities of Water. Water shapes, changes, and realigns the bodies, landscapes, buildings, and public spaces of Nairobi's slums. It oscillates in between hard and soft surfaces, making them porous and supple, and sometimes bringing them to breaking point. Lives are structured around how much water costs, where it flows, when it doesn't, how it falls, and how quickly or slowly it travels throughout a tightly knit urban fabric. This film is a series of portraits, both hopeful and sometimes heartbreaking. Portraits that blur the line between the built environment, people, animals, water, and ecological systems. Water is a social force. It constitutes bodies, cities, economic life, and cultural activities bringing these into relationship with one another. Uh, Professor Adrian Parr, uh, may I ask you, what is the role that, uh, of communities in fighting uh, climate change? 
Um, I think it's central, as I mentioned before, that if, if you only have top-down development and planning initiatives, then there's a disconnect between the efficacy of those initiatives as they play out on the ground plan. And so no matter how well-intentioned you might be at the upper level in trying to create what you know you describe as inclusive sustainable initiatives it can only be inclusive insofar as you involve a variety of stakeholders but at the same time i think what's really important to underscore here what i learned in the work that i was doing um, in the slums of nairobi is that when we think of uh, minority populations it's really important that we don't think of them as flat populations and what i mean by that is they themselves have their own forms of striated social organizations their own hierarchies and so we have to be cognizant of the ways in which those hierarchies also work within the ground plane to ensure that we maximize full inclusion of all the stakeholders in the best way that we possibly can professor carlos moreno de quelle façon selon vous peut professor carlos moreno how can we improve the role of communities of people in fighting climate change and how can we in the future make sure that we have access to clean water in cities well it's it's a very important issue for the future of uh, cities we need to uh, think about it uh, in light of the current uh, climate generation as it is uh, sometimes uh, referred to. I think that in our cities, people have got a very big role to play. And I think we need to educate people when it comes to climate. This is why we have an Institute for Climate Education here in uh, Paris to uh, help young people and teenagers understand what all of this is about. And I think we need to uh, also understand that it's good to be against climate change, but you also need to change the way in which you behave every day. You can't uh, march against climate change and then when you come home, uh, consume uh, products that are not useful or made up uh, of plastic and, and, and which uh, in its production releases a lot, uh, a lot of CO2. It's important, for example, to not use disposable plastic bottles, to drink water from the tap rather from uh, the supermarket, especially in cities where uh, the uh, water from the tap is uh, drinkable. And in this film, we see that uh, in some uh, countries, access to water is extremely difficult. So we need to come to terms with the fact that social inclusion in our cities is not a reality. There is a lot of poverty. So it's down to us to make sure that in our daily lives, in everything that we do, we uh, don't uh, do anything that widens this gap. I was born in Latin America. I know what it's like to live in a place where there is no water. I know what it's like to uh, be uh, someone who can't drink water without falling ill because of parasites. So what we have in Europe is a great chance in a way, but in a way we are part of the problem when we are uh, buying meat from uh, Brazil uh, that comes from herds that uh, that uh, are in the Amazon forest and uh, which are the reason why these trees have been uh, uh, chop chopped down. So this is what I'd like to, to say, and this is the whole point also of the Climate Academy, sorry, I mentioned Institute, it's the Climate Academy that's there to teach young people what uh, climate change is all about. There's also another very important issue, that of uh, heritage converse, cons, conversation, oh, sorry, conservation. We will need to move to the next uh, parts of uh, this uh, debate. And I was saying uh, there are a lot of stakes for the future, but also about uh, preserving our past and our historical sites, our heritage. So let's now have a look at a video uh, regarding the historic city of Yazd. Here are the Yazd, the capital of Iran Ertan architecture, one of the biggest World Heritage cities, and is Dr. Abbasi in charge of Yazd World Heritage site. 
every year. Many tourists visit the historic city, but not after corona pandemic. Now we try to keep physical distancing and still be socially and economically alive through funding the internet market to support traditional industries and providing local health protocols to reopen conservation projects as the source of livelihood. Furthermore, the city is presented in virtual spaces and social media by local community. Staying home is the best chance to learn from the history. Emerge from hard condition of desert, Yaz teaches us how to turn limitations to opportunities. So as you saw uh, this video of Yazd, which I should have mentioned is in Iran. Uh, so uh, perhaps, um, uh, Seokjin Moon, why would you say uh, our cultural heritage is so important and needs to be preserved? How can communities and its uh, values help preserve uh, these rich cultural sites uh, via using uh, the narratives and associated uh, local traditions? Uh, in case of uh, the city, uh, we have uh, the especially have uh, the uh, some dark uh, culture. It's uh, the uh, our the memorial area. Uh, as you see, uh, we have uh, the uh, another uh, history uh, from the, the invasion uh, from the Japan. So uh, our the uh, the jail is uh, the prison uh, museum is uh, our one kind of uh, the, uh, historical uh, the area. And uh, it's uh, the good to see uh, uh, and uh, to show uh, how we can uh, uh, educate our history uh, to our generations and uh, to our uh, citizens, especially in our community. Uh, base of our the, uh, citizens uh, understand the history of our, our the past uh, uh, times and uh, we can remember uh, the uh, uh, sad uh, history and uh, we also uh, wanted to have uh, the good relationships uh, between uh, our the neighbors uh, but uh, it is not easy as you see uh, still it's uh, the uh, very sensitive uh, to the, the uh, uh, foreign affairs. But even though uh, our the historical area is uh, the uh, good uh, the education factor uh, to the people, and uh, we have to preserve uh, uh, our uh, this type of uh, the, uh, cultures, uh, even though is uh, the brilliant or dark. Uh, so uh, it's uh, the same to uh, another countries. And uh, uh, from the, the history and the, from the, this uh, cultural uh, heritage, we can obtain the, the vision uh, to the future. And uh, we can have uh, the good uh, uh, realities uh, nowadays. So uh, we need uh, uh, the good education, but it is not easy as like uh, this untaxed uh, society, uh, but we have to develop the online uh, communication uh, education uh, kids uh, to the people and we are developing as like that. Thank you very much. Uh, we need to uh, move on to the uh, next and last uh, video as we are running out of time and I would like to ask you all for closing remarks. So uh, let's now watch this uh, video on anti-discrimination uh, from Heidelberg. Dear representatives of UNESCO, as a director of the Office of Equal Opportunities of the city of Heidelberg, I want to thank you for giving us the opportunity to contribute to this year's celebration of World Cities Day. The masterclass Colonial Continuities and Climate Activism that we have been organizing together with UNESCO International Coalition of Inclusive and Sustainable Cities is a concrete example for this year's theme of World Cities Day, Community-Centered Urban Development. 
a masterclass, gave the city of Heidelberg the opportunity to start a conversation between different civil society actors and local communities. A needed conversation that also connects discussions around climate change with racism. To work together on common responses for the urgent challenges our societies are facing, especially in the times of COVID-19. It was a great chance for us to show how crucial the meaningful involvement of communities, their needs and visions, is to work on truly inclusive and sustainable cities. It also showed how important the cooperation with UNESCO is to give a platform for the different voices and perspectives to be heard and seen. The Office for Equal Opportunities of the City of Heidelberg is also the office of the European Coalition of Cities Against Racism. It is our role to address racism and colonial continuities on a city level, not only when we're organizing a masterclass. We couldn't do that in an inclusive way without engaging with local communities in all their diversity. Therefore, I want to use this chance and end my video message with saying thank you to all the partners that supported us in organizing our first masterclass on colonial continuities and climate activism. Thank you to UNESCO, thank you to ICA for providing the platform, and last but not least, I want to thank, of course, all the local communities and civil society actors, all the activists, for who are working hard on making our cities more inclusive and sustainable with their knowledge and their involvement is key. Thank you. And I would like to end uh, this debate with quickly asking all of you very briefly, if you can do this in 30 seconds, uh, what would you think, uh, what would you say are the main uh, focuses uh, we should work on to uh, make our cities uh, better for their inhabitants? Uh, Adrian Parra, I'll start with you. Thanks so much. I think the world's biggest wicked problems around political polarization, uh, ecological collapse, climate change and social and economic inequity are, are some of the biggest challenges that we face. Cities are part of the problem, but they're also part of the solution. And I think we have a tremendous opportunity here within the ways in which we think about urban life to address those wicked problems moving forward. Thank you, Professor Adrian Parr. Uh, Carlos Moreno? What would you say is the biggest challenge ahead of us and what we should, we should focus our work on? We cannot hear the speaker, his mic is off. I'm really sorry, I'm really sorry. I would like uh, during this World Cities Day, which we're celebrating today, and I thank UNESCO for the invitation, conclude by four words that our major challenges, ecology, with regards to climate and biodiversity, proximity to live differently in our cities, uh, facing the health and ecological challenges, solidarity, we have to take care of the weakest, to leave no one behind, uh, live in uh, a world where people are humanists and each and every one of us should be actor of change. So the city should be a creative city. The creative city is not only an, ecolo an ecological city, but it's a humane city and it's humanity in cities that we have to find again because we lost it and it's a major challenge for us, for our children, our grandchildren and for the planet. Thank you. Thank you to you, Carlos Moreno. What would you say to do to create uh, better cities and make uh, their inhabitants' lives uh, better? Thank you again for having me in this uh, wonderful discussion. As a member of uh, UNESCO Learning Cities Network, it was a great pleasure to learn from many experts insight on how cities can be sustainable level. Due to the COVID-19, we are facing the unprecedented challenges with uncertainty. Future of cities is peril too. With this crisis, I think we need to revisit the way we have developed the cities. Uh, more human-centered approach in urban development is essential 
as opposed to a materialistic way of a development, which has been dominant over the past century. But I am optimistic. We, the human, always find a solution uh, to a problem, learning from our mistakes. With all of us get involved, I believe that we can have more sustainable city after this crisis ends. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sokjin Moon. And uh, if we have Adeline Grattar, uh, star chef, uh, Adeline Grattar, oui. est avec nous. Voilà, Vous m'entendez? Uh, notamment à l'origine du Yamcha. Can you hear me? Yes, uh, Adeline Grattar, who opened up Yamcha. I would like to ask you very quickly what are the elements which we have to work upon for our cities to be better for the citizens. Well, I believe that each individual should feel responsible of something small. Everyone should commit either for the environment or elsewhere. We have to call each individual to feel assisted. No, you will not get everything for free. You have to commit, work, and be tolerant and open. A lot of tolerance, a lot of openness. Those will be the last words of this debate. Mind, to be open-minded, that will be uh, the last words from this uh, debate. Thank you all very much for being with us. Thank you for sharing your experience and your expertise. And I would now like uh, to give the floor to Ernesto Ottone, Assistant Director General for Culture at UNESCO, for his closing remarks. Dear majors, dear representative from UNESCO cities, dear colleagues, and friends, ladies and gentlemen. We have reached the end of a very memorable celebration of this year's World City Day, which brought us together to reflect on the central role of communities in achieving sustainable urban development. The global team of this year, valuing our communities and cities, perfectly mirrors the current action being undertaken in response to the pandemic around the world. COVID-19 is impacting all our lives, and we are seeing firsthand how critical it is to leverage ingenuity and strength at the local level. Community-driven response and recovery actions, which put people at their centre, are a critical part of the response to the global crisis. I wish to thank all of you for your active participation in our celebrations. A special thanks to the participant of the Urban Dialogue Session, who not only share with us their experiences and thoughts about community-centred urban development, but also shed light on how communities are the building blocks for the sustainable and resilient cities of tomorrow. Dear friends, UNESCO advocates for more people-centred cities, cities that promote cultural diversity and social inclusion, build resilience and sustainability, harness learning and creativity, and nurture connectivity and collaboration. One of the main objectives of the UNESCO Cities Platform is to bring together the organization's eight city networks and programs to strengthen its work in the urban context by building synergies, exploring new avenues for intervention, as well as supporting diverse urban stakeholders, including countries and cities around the world. As the city is a diverse and dynamic ecosystem, the UCP also follows a similar notion of working collectively to enhance the organization work in the urban context. By applying a multidisciplinary perspective to contemporary urban challenges, the UCP brings together culture, social inclusion, innovative educational practices, technological solutions, and scientific research to support cities in devising more people-centered urban solutions. Joining forces and strengthening our efforts, as well as acquiring data, resources, knowledge, and practice, are the main priority of UNESCO Cities Platform as we look towards 2030 and beyond. 
the UNESCO City Platform will continue to explore and strengthen new and existing collaboration among its members' network and programs, as well as with cities all over the world. Together, we will continue to work towards the achievement of SDG 11 on sustainable and inclusive cities. Once again, thank you for your engagement in this endeavor. Thank you so much. And we've also seen how to make cities better, to create a better life, lives for their inhabitants. Uh, once again, thank you all for being with us on this very special day. And we wish you all a very good day. Thank you again. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, bye bye. Thank and you, bye bye. Thank you all for uh, being with us again today. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day.